Warning, this podcast may contain graphic and triggering content. Please listen at your own risk. Each individual struggle is different and everyone's recovery and healing journey is different. Please reach out to a certified medical professional if you need help. Welcome to episode 22 of Stomp the Stigma, the podcast aimed to fight the stigma surrounding mental health through education, awareness, experiences, stories, resources, and the vulnerable truth. Joining me to Stomp the Stigma today is Christy Melhorn once again. Today is part two of our incredible conversation. If you didn't get to hear part one, go back and listen to episode 21 from last week. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of our conversation. It was incredible and I learned so much from Christy and I have so much respect for everything that she's been through. So enjoy. I think like a big part of our society and our culture is the ideal body and something that the the media portrays a lot is the thin um, model body that everyone should strive for you know so when people comment like oh you look so skinny or you look so good whatever um, they don't realize how hurtful it can be to people that have struggled with weight issues or eating disorders or anything like that so I don't know for anyone that's listening is there like a a compliment or a phrase that you prefer people say to you that is such a good question (laughs) yeah I've tried to kind of figure that one out as well I know like if to be to be totally honest, and I might be like blowing my own horn a little bit here, but I think having been through an eating disorder, I can tell immediately if someone I know is going through something like that. Like I can tell so quickly Mm -hmm. based on the way that they're actually, um, based on the way that their shoulders, their shoulder bones are protruding. That's always a sign to me and just behavior around food. But, um, Hmm. Um, when I was going through what I was going through, everyone had something to say about my body for the most part. And I had a couple of friends who were more about like, uh, during that time, more about like my personality and were more about like, you seem like you're like, like, Oh, you're, you're so much fun. Or like, you seem like yourself and you seem more like yourself. I remember people saying that to me, like, and that actually made me feel really good. Yeah. I don't know how that would make other people feel, but in my particular case, the best, most supportive statement was um, you you feel like yourself again. Like you're like your sunny, bright uh, self. You're like laughing and smiling. And um, that was really, really helpful for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, when I was going, especially like when I was going through the early stages of recovery from that, um oh my gosh it was so hard (laughs) it's like I remember running into this guy who I met like in the worst of it and I was just like a skeleton I remember running into him at a cafe and it was (laughs) like it was so much of a nightmare that it was kind of funny actually he was like you're so voluptuous now like you're so filled out and (laughs) you know you're so curvy and (laughs) it was like okay, first of all, shut up. You're like a creep dude. And you have like, it's just famous how great. And like, oh my God, this is just like a recipe for like, <laughs> like the worst things that you could say to me right now. Like, oh my God, you were so skinny and lean and thin before. And now you're so thick and voluptuous and like this and that. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I just, yeah, it was just so, like, dramatic and ridiculous. I couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, I really, uh, wanna, yeah. I really want to normalize just not talking about people's weight in general. Like, at all. I feel like it's so unnecessary. And if you can comment on their personality or their energy, when someone tells me that I have good energy... That is like the best compliment ever. Or like to just telling somebody that you you seem really happy. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that's so much better. And I, I really want to normalize that. Totally. Um, I remember uh, between like, I mean, 
the sleep deprivation, like the insomnia spell really hit hard after my eating disorder, but like during both recovery stages, um, I was just so upset. Like I felt like I couldn't engage with the world in a creative fulfilling way anymore. Like I just knew that my, like my soul knew that my body was compromised and I couldn't mm-hmm. express it to the fullest. And that was really hard on me. That was super upsetting. So when that started to like reignite and um, I was connecting with people again, and that was so, sort of more of like, like I, I think one of my friend's moms, uh, because like obviously with my mom having passed, I'm very lucky that a lot of my friend's moms swooped in to help nurture me growing up. Um, one of my friend's moms was um, like, I can see you in your eyes again. Like I can oh. see you in your face. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> oh, I love that so much. Yeah. I'm just so glad that I that I went through the shit to get back. I, mm-hmm. I am so glad that um, I, I have a couple friends who I kind of, I haven't seen in years, but I kind of watch from afar and I know that they're struggling with eating disorders I'm not really in a place where um, I feel like I could help them myself um, just for like a number of reasons, but I think about them and my heart goes out to them and I I do definitely worry about them. I just know that they have it in them to like get back to who they really are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the hard parts about, um, I don't want to say overcoming, but like recovering or healing from, an eating disorder is that food is an essential for life. And so you have these feelings and the guilt and the shame kind of in the back of your mind, I think, and they never fully go away. So the fact that food is necessary for life and you have to kind of face that every single day makes it so much harder for people that have been through like what you've been through. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because part of why it's so easy to develop an eating disorder is because it's so accessible and it's such a necessity. It's something that like you can easily manipulate and control. Um, But you're, but you're right. (laughs) While it's easy to manipulate and control in the beginning, when you are recovering from something like that, and it works both ways too. like people, um, I have someone very close to me, a couple people actually who have really struggled with binge eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And um, exactly like you said, with food readily available and essential to your existence, um, it's, it's a very emotional uh, tumultuous process on a daily basis to get to that place where you feel okay with eating and you're, you're more in tune with your hunger signals and that you don't, Uh, carry those feelings of guilt for Mm -hmm. just simply giving your body sustenance like giving your body what you need and I think too that when it comes to like what you were saying earlier about the uh, really thin frame that absolutely is praised and put on a pedestal um, what a lot of people don't understand and that like what I had to understand about myself too is that like you're there's there are genetic factors that go into looking like that. Like, it's just so ridiculous how some of those magazines that we were exposed to growing up mm-hmm. were all about like, get this body by doing this. And then yep. you do those things and you're nowhere. Like you just, your, your body is not designed to look like that. And that's fine. Like you're still beautiful and you're still powerful and athletic and it doesn't change your uh, intelligence it doesn't change your self-worth in any way yeah yeah oh 100 percent. you also had what you call a catastrophically impressive mental breakdown <laughs> yeah <laughs> was that after was that after all of um the rest of it that you talked about already it sure was <laughs> it was crazy oh my gosh I will be honest that sometimes like 
because uh, I obviously still s struggle with anxiety and depression, um, comes and goes and waves. And there definitely are times where I look back on the last couple of years and I get so emotional because there were times like mm -hmm. where I just felt like I could not catch a break. And um, when I kind of, when I started eating better, um, like I said, I, I was sleeping okay for the first little bit. Uh, my body was just so happy to be eating properly. And then the thing was, was that I didn't have, like food was my coping mechanism. My eating disorder was my coping mechanism for really intense internal stuff mm -hmm. that was going on. It was gone. Suddenly my eating disorder was gone. My coping mechanism, my core coping mechanism to keep yeah. these terrifying feelings, these terrifying experiences at bay, it was gone. So at night, I started developing horrible panic attacks, and I just could not get to sleep. And then I would try to muscle through it, and eventually I would fall asleep, but I wasn't really entering a deep sleep at all. I was in such a state of high alarm that I was having a very surface sleep, and it started out where, yeah, I would like kind of sleep, I guess, for seven to eight hours, but I'd wake up feeling like garbage. I'm like, what is going on here? And then um, I didn't really realize that I wasn't entering that REM cycle at first. I was like, this makes no sense. Like I technically slept for like seven to eight hours. Mm -hmm. And then um, that went on for a couple months. And I did contact my doctors a few times, um, got all the blood work done. Everything came out normal, but there was something not right. And I just put myself through the ringer trying to figure out what was going on. Like I remember calling health link. I remember calling just different resources around the city being like, my body feels like this. Like I feel really tired and I feel like, um, kind of shaky and I'm not sure it like, is this, is this a reaction from my eating disorder? Like, is this my body trying to heal? That's what I thought at first. Mm -hmm. I was like, it could just be my body trying to heal. And every single person who I talked to, most for the most part, they were like, you just need to relax. And I was like, well, I'm trying. Like, I'm not working. I'm hardly working out uh, because I can't. I'm so tired. Like, hardly working out, um, you know, taking baths, like doing all the typical self-care things that I've since learned, like kind of kind of the common self-care mechanisms. They just don't work for everyone. Like there's no, you know, there, there's some suggestions that are awesome, but like some of them actually can activate people more than they can calm them down. Mm -hmm. And that happened. Like I could not sit in a bath. I would lose my mind. Wow. Um, better at it now, but at the moment, no. Um, so I remember I did this amazing dance show. It was super fun. And then it was like, I used like any last ounce of energy that I had was in that dance show and then I was just done. I remember going for a walk like a couple days after it ended and I got tunnel vision while walking. I was in Confederation Park and I felt like I was going to throw up and fall over. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know what's wrong with me. And it really scared me. So I remember I went back to work actually. I like sat down and I was trying to work and trying to focus, but I was so rattled and shaky. To this day, I don't really know exactly what happened there. Like it could have been a panic attack combined with exhaustion mm -hmm. um, that created that sensation, but it was awful. I just remember feeling so scared, like, what is this? And uh, for the next couple of months, it was in and out of the ER multiple times. Um, again, every single time I went in, oh, well, it might, you know, it might have to do with your thyroid, but your thyroid's perfectly fine. Like all the numbers are fine, so we don't know. Um, you need to just relax. Oh my God. If I've taken anything away from this, never, never tell someone who has severe anxiety issues to just relax. Yeah. Like it's just the same thing as depression. Like just be happy. Like, you know, you don't have to feel like this. Just like, you know, smile, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Like do not tell someone who's going through panic attacks and anxiety to relax. Cause that's the least helpful thing. Um, yeah, that is one of my biggest pet peeves for sure. Oh my gosh. It's so, it's just so minimizing and it's so um, unrealistic, honestly, very uneducated, very undereducated about how the mind works. Um, yeah, I was in and out of the ER multiple times. I think I was in there around Christmas at one point. <laughs> 
I remember that very well because my old roommate, um, she was so good. She took me to the ER and they had like the saddest Christmas tree ever. (laughs) It was like this little Charlie Brown Christmas tree that had like a string of lights that just someone like threw onto it. And I just remember like, that was like a highlight of that scary ER trip. And I remember talking to, I just felt so sick. That's right. I felt so sick. And I called HealthLink before heading there. And I'll never forget this conversation with this lady. I explained to her my background. I said, I had an eating disorder. Like I'm eating now. I feel stable. And she goes, she's asking me all these questions. She's just grilling me with all these questions. And she goes, well, um, how much do you weigh right now? And I told her like this and this and this. And then she goes, what do you think people think about you when they see you? And I said, that I'm tall and strong and athletic. And she goes, really? Consider that. And she goes, if you don't change your ways, you're going to end up in a box someday. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, you fucking bitch. Like, it was so mean. So anyway, I freaked out. After she said that, I just totally freaked out. My roommate drove me to the hospital. You just need to relax. I was like, thanks for nothing. And in all fairness to them, like, they're so overworked. I can't imagine what it's like working in a hospital and, like, the amount of dollars that go into securing a bed for every single person. It's all really messed up. Mm -hmm. But um, once again, like, I just felt like I had no help. So I tried to, again, like, muscle it out for a bit. And then I just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And I got to the point where I could hardly do anything. I was working a couple, like two jobs at the time. I had to constantly get my shifts covered because I felt so sick and exhausted. Um, And then it all started coming to a serious head around spring. I remember after my birthday, which is uh, at the start of May, I was like, something is seriously wrong with me. Like I must have a cancer I must have a tumor something more has to be wrong here Mm -hmm. because I feel like I'm dying and little did I know I technically was because you sleep deprivation kills you so I was slowly dying and uh, I was I was so distrustful of the hospital and doctors at that point because of what I'd already experienced and because my mom when we were growing up and my mom started showing signs of illness they just cast her aside as having anxiety and depression and doctors consistently tried to do that for a, our doctor was really out to lunch and tried to just give my mom all these anxiety and depression meds, but that was not the case. My mom could hardly speak at times. My mom couldn't write her signature anymore. She couldn't drive anymore. And then she was eventually diagnosed with PICS at, uh, by two researchers at the University of Calgary because the disease is so rare. Wow. But my mom went for years undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. I knew there was something wrong with her when I was four. And she didn't get get diagnosed until I was nine. So um, years of limbo, right? So here I am feeling like there has to be something more wrong with me. And the doctors don't know what they're talking about. Like I just knew that they weren't addressing the problem properly. Um, And then when you are sleep deprived, your hormones are a mess. Um, Your anxiety is just through the roof. So it was even, all those fears were amplified tenfold. I went to two naturopaths who who reamed me for pretty much everything I'm worth. I can't believe how much I paid for some of that stuff that did literally nothing for me. I hate to say it. I'm not against naturopathy or holistic healing. I'm not. But for what I was going through, I really, the, the assessments were not in alignment at all with what I was going through. And I did not need supplements. I needed sleep. Mm -hmm. But I was so desperate. I spent so much money between those two naturopaths. And then um, finally, oh yeah, I forgot to talk about sometime around March, there was like this super stressful episode. I had two credit card scams, like consecutively, Um, the place that I was living in with my three other roommates, it fell apart. There was so much water in the, Uh, insulation in the ceiling from a damaged roof that chunks of my roommate's ceiling started falling off so we had oh my god it was so stressful we we had to move like on the fly basically I moved into um a family's place but like it just was not a good environment for me to be in for many different reasons 
And uh, yeah, I finally just like started losing my mind. Um, but yeah, then come May, all of that happened. I saw the naturopaths and I had like no money left at this point. And um, I was just a complete stress case. I was like, I don't know what to do. I do not know what to do with myself. I can't live like this. And that's when the severe suicidal feelings set in. I was like, I don't even know why I'm here. Like, mm-hmm. I can hardly function. Yeah. This is a nothing life. I can't, like, I, and just remembering what I've achieved previously in my life and feeling like that, feeling just like this useless shell, it was such a nightmare. And uh, I remember it was so nice that summer. And I just was felt so isolated and alone because I couldn't handle being out. Mm-hmm. I was so tired. I finally didn't sleep for like two days and two nights in a row. I had like the hugest panic attack of my life. I drove around the city like a maniac because I just didn't know what else to do. And uh, my dad was like, we, okay, I can't be like this anymore. Took me to the doctor, um, told them I was severely suicidal, begged for a referral to the hospital. And they said, well, depression hurts. Here's some, um, here's some Prozac. I've since learned that that is so illegal. The protocol is that they have to keep you there, call the police and have you be escorted to the hospital. If you have someone who is flat out admitted that they're suicidal, you, you can't let them leave. They did that to me twice in a row. I went back the next day and I said, this did nothing. Like I'm exhausted. I I just didn't sleep last night. Well, hmm, here's a different type of sleeping pill for you to try. And finally that night, I talked to mobile mental health in Calgary. They're great for anyone listening. Mobile mental health is amazing. And they kind of said, they were like, if you go another night without sleep, if you feel like this, call the police and have them take you in. Mm -hmm. Okay. That night I tried to sleep. I laid laid down and I I kept my Fitbit on because I wanted to see how high my heart rate was going at night. And um, my heart rate went up to 112. I just laid down and my heart rate was at 112 and I was like, okay, that's enough. And I just, I packed my stuff. Oh, I forgot to mention like the two nights that I didn't sleep. I had to fight the uncontrollable urge not to kill myself, like all night, both nights. I wanted to stab myself to death, which was really violent. Like a lot of the time I've heard, I don't know if this is true. I've heard that women tend to find like more soft ways to die, like Mm -hmm. to commit suicide, like self poisoning. But I had to resist everything in my power not to pull out the knife from the drawer in my family's Mm -hmm. kitchen. And all night I was just like, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And uh, I swear it was just my soul that kept me alive that night. It was definitely a spiritual thing. But yeah, that night I was like, I can't go through I can't do this another night. And I called them. I was like, (laughs) <laughs> call the police. I was very blunt. I was like, hi, I'm calling myself in on suicide. I haven't slept in like a year. And if I go another night, I'm going to kill myself. And they were like, okay, sending a, sending someone right now. <laughs> I took my, uh, Fjall Raven backpack, which I actually really don't like, put my laptop in it, packed like a bunch of spare underwear, my toothbrush, wore the comfiest clothes that I had. And I sat out on the sidewalk waiting for them and uh, they were so good. The police were so good. They, I mean, they, they had to check and ensure that I was legit first because sometimes people call and do things like that to try and get away from an abusive situation. But I was very honest and they were like, they questioned me for a bit and they were like, okay, we can tell that like you genuinely want the help and we want to help people like you. So they took me, they took me to the hospital and I actually ran into one of my old Starbucks regulars who was also a cop. I remember running into him in the back of the hospital, um, waiting to be admitted, but they sat with me. It took so long to get in. It took like three hours and those two police officers sat with me the entire time. And they told me funny stories. Like they really helped keep me, um, you know, keep me distracted in a way. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was in the ER. <laughs> one of my old Starbucks coworkers was one of the nurses that I ran into during that time. Um, yeah, I was in the ER. I had permission to leave because I was voluntary, I think. 
there are a lot of people who are brought in like involuntarily and they, there's like a separate space in the hospital for them. I think I was in there for like four days and I visited a psychiatrist came to see me and I told her what was going on. And she was like, okay, we'll make sure you get a bed and uh, you can stay for a bit. And of course, like, I mean, I did, I called in on suicide and there were so many mental health struggles that led up to it. So I, after four days of like kind of bumping around and um, getting more things from home, I secured a bed in the psych unit, uh, which was initially fucking terrifying. I was just so crushed when I first walked in and I realized what was going on. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, they did kind of warn me that I, I would be a bit of an anomaly in that space. I mean, there's everyone in, in, in the psych ward, there's everyone from someone who is just experiencing like intense work stress to people who have six severe mental health conditions from schizophrenia, uh, depression, anxiety, BPD, like you name it. Mm-hmm. And I, I swear, um, I remember walking in and the doors are obviously locked. So like you have to be buzzed in and out. And, um, just seeing kind of like just the most zoned out people sitting and watching TV. It was like literally like drool coming out of their mouths and walking past them and coming around to the nurse's desk. And they had to go through all my bags, take out my phone, take out my laptop, uh, take out anything, glass, razors, anything that could inflict self-harm. And I was just like, Oh my God, this is so intense. Uh, you felt like, like it almost in a weird kind of way felt like prison Mm -hmm. in that initial moment, but I knew I needed to be there. And, um, it was really funny. Actually, my friend's mom sent me flowers while I was in there and they had to like take the vase and put it away separately because it was glass and put the like this like luxurious bouquet into a plastic cup, (laughs) a party cup. It was super funny. Um, yeah, they had to like, oh God, I remember going in there with all my freaking supplements that I paid way too much money for from like the naturopathy clinics and I was like you can just keep those I don't think I need those right now and uh, there was like a lady sitting kind of like near the nurse's station there was a lady sitting at this lower table beside it just madly coloring in on coloring sheets and paper was flying off the table and she was like throwing her head back and her eyes were rolling back and she was like maniacally laughing as like crayons are breaking and I was like holy hell where am I and um they took me to my room and uh you know I I think I was sharing with someone at the time and um just like my little single bed uh a little nightstand and a lamp and set all my things up and I was really grateful to have the help there were definitely times where I was like how is this how is this my life like mm-hmm. how did I get here I was like a an honors graduate student I graduated with a 3.9 GPA I won awards in university I had professors like wanting me to do a master's and work with them like you know, I was dancing. I'm like getting paid to dance now. And like, I, now I'm here. Like, yeah, what is this? And I just remember sobbing, like getting in there and just sobbing and just not knowing, like, was I ever going to get better? Was I ever going to be able to live my life? Like, was I going to die here? And, um, I had a lot of support. My friend's really good friend's dad came over that day and this was actually like epic. He came to visit and he was trying to keep me calm and he kind of kept me grounded. We were sitting in the main common area and I have to be so careful about describing people because that's like a breach of confidentiality. But there was a lady sitting on this like (laughs) sticky leather couch across from me So I went in in June. The anniversary of me going in is coming up really soon. There's this lady just like sprawled out on the couch across from me. And she had like these super blunt little bangs. It was like, you know, when you're a kid and you like (laughs) cut your own bangs. Yeah. It's kind of like just like super watery eyes and um, really squinty. And she's just, just laying there with her head perched on her fist. She's staring at me really hard. 
and Kim and I, uh, my friend's dad, were chatting and chatting, and suddenly she just pipes in and she goes, what are you here for, honey? She's like, anxiety, depression, suicide. I was like, yeah. <laughs> and she was like, she just stops and she goes, welcome to the ward, sweetheart. <laughs> oh my God. I am not kidding you. That literally happened. My friend's dad is my witness. Despite the fact that I was literally falling apart from despair in that moment, that made me laugh. We had to get up and keep going. We were just like, oh my God. That <laughs> It's like something you see in a movie. <laughs> Truly. Like, it, it seriously, like, it was kind of like a, sp- my time in the psych ward was kind of like a spinoff of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. Like, it's the scary nurses. Like, That's I actually had it really great. sounds like. There. Let me tell you, like, being in there and living, I was in there for over a month, living with people who have been through so much and have, you know, endured so many different types of mental health issues. It was the biggest, the biggest smack in the face of reality I've ever had in my life. Wow. I was like, this is what people go through. This, this is what it is to be human. And I, I was definitely scared at times. There was one guy who I really hope I don't get in trouble for telling this story, but I'm telling it anyway. Um, there was one guy who just totally snapped. I think he'd come from a prison or something and no one really knew what his backstory was. So he, there were containment rooms. There were rooms where people had to be, you know, sedated and Mm -hmm. kept in for for everyone's safety and for their own. This one guy, he was, um, I remember knowing, like noticing he was kind of weird. He, there were a lot of creepy men in there, like just the way they would eye you up and stuff. Um, but he was definitely a little bit like that. And then, um, oh my God, while I was in there, I got a terrible tooth infection. I think the tooth pulled while I was in there. It was just such a nightmare. But then like a couple nights before getting my tooth pulled, I was just laying awake in agony. And I could hear, it was a really hot day and I could hear him running down the hall, like these steps just thundering. <laughs> like, And uh, I could hear him go up to the nurse's desk and he was like, He's like, the solar energy from the sky has seeped into the earth and there's going to be an earthquake and it's going to dismantle the hospital and we have to evacuate the whole hospital right now. <laughs> Let me tell you that, like, it was not short of entertaining at times. <laughs> but that same guy, like, I think it was the next day he just totally snapped. He was in the common area and he got up and just took a chair and threw it at the windows And then the nurses came over to calm him down and he strangled one of the nurses so badly that she had to go to the ER. And uh, it was a team of like four or five nurses who jumped him and sedated him. And um, yeah, that happened while I was there. Uh, One of the other girls who was in there at the same time as we went for a walk one day and came back freaking out, like shaking, freaking out. And she 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 had ms from what i remember um i don't recall her having like a you know something like schizophrenia or anything like anything that would cause hallucin hallucin hallucinations i don't remember but she came in she was just a mess she was she was telling us that like this guy popped out and he was covered in blood and um had like a stab wound there was some weird stuff that went on in the bushes around where i was there really there there was yeah, I remember that. And it was really, I felt so bad for her. I was in there, like I said, I was in there for a month. And then I just didn't know where to go. Oh my gosh, I had nowhere to go. Like I couldn't go back to my family's house. Yeah, I eventually, I, I remember leaving on the 4th of July as like a symbol, I guess. <laughs> I was like, Independence Day. <laughs> my day that I, I ended up, uh, I, had, I had no idea where to go at first, but then a family friend pulled through and they actually uh, took me in so graciously and so without even blinking an eye they're like well you can come stay with us and they lived in the this amazing house across from my childhood home and getting to spend that month in the summer with them was just the most i i honestly can't think of something more healing the like the universe really kicked in there and did me a huge favor i remember feeling like i've got a second chance at life now 
It took a while, it took a long time for my sleep to be stabilized. It took a long time to find the right uh, medication to help me. Because mm-hmm. when you're that sleep deprived and that anxious, it's really difficult to sleep mm-hmm. and to cut down. But I stayed with them and then I did the day program at the hospital for another month. And that's where I met people who, the two psychiatrists who I credit for saving my life and who I'm still in contact to this, with to this day. Yeah, they've mm-hmm. taught me so much. I'm so lucky that I've had access to a psychiatrist, uh, the same person for the last couple of years. That's a gift. And it's just made me realize how important that is to have that consistent figure in your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was a lot that went on. Oh my God. So like I said, someday I really want to put it into a book and I'll try and include as much as I can without like, breaching any kind of confidentiality, <laughs> Yeah, but it was something else. You I can't totally believe it's so sometimes. That's such a crazy story, but that's an incredible story. I think you should totally write a book. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. There's so much stigma around the, just the idea of having a mental breakdown or being admitted to the hospital or a psych ward. Like, I think a lot of people think that you have to be like clinically insane or crazy to to have one and like it means that you're like losing your mind really. Yeah. Do you carry any kind of shame or guilt around having had a mental breakdown because of the stigmas that kind of come with it? Um... I remember while I was in there, there were times where I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm this person. We would go for walks and we had to be like, I I did have privileges where I could leave for like up to half an hour, half an hour to an hour at the time, whatever the max privilege was, I did have it. Mm -hmm. Um, But then we would, if like, I had to be escorted off the hospital grounds. Like I couldn't leave without someone with me. And uh, I remember us going for group walks and uh, being guided by the nurses. And I was like, I can't believe (laughs) I'm this person. Like I'm this person who I've like ridden my bike past or something. Who's like, you know, part of this, this group who needs this nurse facilitated, uh, I don't know, activity, I guess. So there were definitely times while I was in there, I was like, I can't believe that this is happening. I I definitely did feel kind of like embarrassed, I guess, about it. But at the same time, I think to, uh, presently, I actually feel like a freaking badass for it. I'm like, I have literally dealt with some of the things that I f- have feared the most in my life. And I have been given the chance to come back from it. Like, not everyone is that lucky mm-hmm. and uh, or that privileged. So I feel like a badass considering what I've been through in my life, like the scope of it, because there's so much more. There's just so much more. I would probably keep you for like three hours telling you everything that it's amazing. I actually remember one of my psychiatrists telling me that it was amazing. I developed not just normally, but advanced to begin with based on what my childhood template looked like. And I'm proud of myself for that. And I'm proud of myself for putting my life into my own hands and taking myself to the psych ward. Like you said, facing the consequences of people stigmatizing me for it or like looking at me weird Mm -hmm. for it. And, uh, Oh my gosh. I remember when I got out, I watched so many movies cause I was so, I was still so tired. I could hardly read anything. So I watched a ton of movies and like all the Avenger movies were coming out around, like there was a new one that came out around then. So I watched all these Avenger movies and I was like, (laughs) I was like the nerd in me was like, I feel like a badass like them. (laughs) I like fought so hard. (laughs) I fought so hard to survive. Yeah, I definitely, I'm actually not against telling people about it. I I do get, I'm conscientious of how different people will react. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in professional settings. I've definitely let it flip before in like work settings. I've been like, oh yeah, like the time I was in the psych ward. Like I just tell (laughs) stories like that. I'll be like, when I was in the psych ward and my, my family thinks it's so funny. They're like, we love that you can just start stories like that. (laughs) um (laughs) yeah like that time I was in the psych ward (laughs) but yeah I think you're right like I think people should be a little bit more understanding that like 
that space is there for a really important reason. Yeah. And it's there to help you through a crisis. And all of us go through crises or crises, I guess, in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And, um, don't have to do it all on your own and you don't have to try and juggle 5 million things while you're in there or or, sorry, while you're in that state of crisis. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you just have to hit pause. I, I, I gave up my entire life to be in there. Well, I'm so glad that you are doing so much better now. And I think you should be so, so proud of yourself for doing that and getting through that. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have such an incredible story. And I'm like, I I feel so lucky to be able to hear it from you. The thing that I really appreciate about you is I can tell that you mean that. Thank you for that. And thank you for listening. Oh my God, you're such a good listener. (laughs) Thank you. I have like a lot of people in my life who interrupt so much. I love them to death, but like... (laughs) I kind of realize, like, talking to you, I'm like, man, she's a good listener. She <laughs> lets me have my time and space. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what you're here for. Like, I mean, it's it's also therapeutic for you to yeah. express it and talk about your whole story and just get it out there. I find that's the same for me. Like, if I can just have a safe space and someone to just talk to you about it and just get it out, like, that – is so therapeutic. It, it is. And I, I realized I haven't really, I haven't really talked about it in detail in a long time. Yeah. And the crazy, crazy work hours that I was doing and just other life things coming up. Uh, the, like you were, we were saying earlier, the expectation to be available all the time with your phone uh, between all those things. I just haven't really, talked about it in great detail Mm -hmm. so that was really really nice and I remembered things that I just totally forgot over the years too so so thank you this is a great refresher for me to start doing some writing and putting that creative project into a healing process into practice absolutely yeah So now, like, looking back on everything, is there any advice that you would give your younger self? Or, I guess, is there any advice that you wish you would have received when you were younger? Yeah, um, I wish that someone, (laughs) there's a couple of different things. The obvious one is I wish that somebody in the medical system or in my life had asked me how my sleep was. I can't believe how little we credit the value of sleep in this culture and in this society. It's crazy. So I really wish that that had come up at some point. Like it's just nuts that it didn't. Um, The second thing would be is you don't have to do this alone, regardless of what like your childhood patterns taught you, regardless of what misconceptions you might have about what other people are going through. You don't have to do this by yourself. There are people who are trained and willing and ready to help you Mm -hmm. and help you thrive. The other one would be don't dismiss yourself and don't let other people dismiss you because I did do that. Like while I definitely did get dismissed by a lot of people in the healthcare industry, I, I dismissed myself too. I was like, I can get through this. You know, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that bad. Like, I was like being eaten alive by depression Mm -hmm. and I was like, Oh, I'll get over it. It's all right. Um, Like I'm really, you know, I'm really, really tired, but I can just push through it and uh, I'll be better soon. That kind of thing. I was dismissing the severity of what I was going through and the uh, (laughs) here's another thing to tie that in. Don't dismiss the power of what is going on in your subconscious and affecting your your daily life because I had no idea how much certain things that were kicking around in the bottom of my head Mm -hmm. were affecting me and my stress levels yeah just because people like to say um well you know put the past behind you it's in the past I think that there is so much value in looking to the past for answers and if you don't you miss out majorly You miss out on so much healing. You miss out on so much emotional processing, um, on fun, like fond memories as well. I am like a hardcore advocate for looking into the past. Go ahead and do it. Like 
I think that not doing it is um, repressive. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I completely agree with that. We talked about it a little bit um, before, but healing from trauma and years of compounded trauma like you have dealt with is such a process. Like it doesn't obviously doesn't just happen overnight. And like the both of us still have our low days. And um, I remember like specific moments that happened to me over the years and just like you do. Um, And it's true what they say, like you don't always remember what people say, um, but you do remember how they made you feel, especially when you're experiencing the bullying and everything when you're a kid. One of our old classmates actually just passed away very recently. I won't say his name. Um, oh, I know. But, yes, yeah. that's right. Yes, and yes. And when I heard that that happened, I was thinking about like memories with him and he was like a jock and a part of... I guess a group that you would call the popular kids. And I just remember being bullied by a lot of his friends, but always, like, he was always so nice to me and never, never said anything, like, hurtful or mean to me. And I remember, like, specific moments when he actually stood up for me in front of other people. And I, I just remember, like, certain comments and stuff like that. So, like, For the most part, you don't always remember what people say, just how they made you feel. But in the case of, I guess, traumatic events, sometimes you do remember those specific details, like words and actions and stuff like that. And like, in our case, I know, like a lot of the jokes and the critical words and like harsh comments, like they, they they do linger a little bit, even though we are healing. But I mean, that is an ongoing process. So I guess I'm curious how you kind of handle those low days and low points and whether you have like coping mechanisms to manage those overwhelming emotions when they do come up. Yeah, I totally do. And I've learned so much, like, uh, especially with the help of my psychiatrists and, Mm -hmm. you know, the years of therapy and just figuring out myself too. Um, Something I'll kind of preface this with is saying that, your, your coping mechanisms can change as you change and the different stages of your life, like something that may have worked at one point, it, uh, you might need something else a little later and that's totally normal. You don't have to feel like scared if, an, if a previous coping mechanism isn't having the same effect. Um, it just means you've grown. But um, something that's really big for me, to be totally honest, is just letting myself feel it out. Mm-hmm. And I um, did this really interesting body work, uh, these body work exercises with a lady here in Calgary. And it was where you just stop and you feel, feel it out, like feel where exactly in your body the feeling is manifesting and you put language to it. You can say like, and even if you're by yourself, you can just, you can think it or you can say it out loud, like, okay, this, this actually feels kind of like um, a stabbing sensation. I know that this is a common one. Um, and I think it's why the word heartbreak exists when you're going through like a terrible breakup or like feeling rejected or something. It like literally feels like someone stabbed you in the heart. And um, so that's, that's just like a common one I've encountered um, in my life and with some like other friends. But uh, yeah, just kind of tuning into yourself and figuring out where exactly in your body it's manifesting, describing the feeling of it and letting yourself um, just meditate on it. And I swear to God, it almost always does dissipate. And after you've had that time to sit with it, it does feel better. It might come back later. Like that can all, that can definitely happen, but in the moment, it's a good way uh, to address it. Um, yeah, you need to feel what you're feeling. I, I really um, have an issue with this social media trend of like pop psychology and mm-hmm. um, toxic positivity. I I agree that positivity is important in your life for sure. Yeah. It can be easy to be indulgent in negativity. Um, but 
just because you're feeling negative or have like a negative feeling doesn't make you a bad person. That's what I don't like about this toxic positivity. Mm -hmm. So you need a space to feel what you're feeling in full without shame. And, uh, or even if you are feeling shame, like feel that too. You, and a way to express it, like whether it's speaking out loud to yourself or to someone you really trust or journaling it out, feel what you feel in all raw earnestness and you will move on past it. And you are entitled to whatever thoughts are coming up there. As long as you're not like directing it at someone to hurt them, go for it. Um, Mm -hmm. believe me, I would not share some of the things I've written in my journals to anyone. (laughs) Try to, if you need to lay in bed for a day, that's totally fair. I, I kind of have like a one day rule where like, I'll give myself a day to be a mope or like, I know that sounds kind of mean, but you know what I mean? Like, let my, just be depressed. And, uh, then after that, I try and keep moving, um, try to get outside, Um, when I was in the hospital, I remember learning that at least one face-to-face verbal interaction a day is like the bare minimum that every human needs to feel, um, some kind of like support and, uh, feel safe. It's, um, definitely important. And whether that's just like going to Starbucks and treating yourself to a coffee or something, uh, that's important too. But I'd say if anyone's interested, like a good good uh ted talk or not ted talk it's um it's an interview between lady gaga and oprah it's amazing i do recommend listening to that um lady gaga kind of goes into her experience with her mental breakdown and um her battle with fibromyalgia and how she keeps going too but i remember something that she was saying in that that i also do is um yeah to just have radical acceptance of yourself of where you are in that moment letting it breathe out and then getting up, washing your face, brushing your teeth, even the the simplest basics, at least try and cover those. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of build from there. You don't have to do everything in a day. I love that. Yeah. I like that you said um, that your coping mechanisms can change. Mm -hmm. I've never really thought about that before, but that is so true. As you grow and as you yourself change, what you need to kind of heal or take a break or, I mean, just for self-care changes. And that is such a good point. I love that. It's so true. Um, Well, thank you. Yeah, I remember when I was in the, like, really early stages of getting out of the hospital, I could not handle having a bath. I would just be sitting in there, a nervous wreck the whole time. Like, it, it activated me. Now I can have a bath. Mm-hmm. And that's like a good form of self care, but yeah, it's really interesting. It can how it can um, cir- circulate like that. Yeah. Okay, I have <laughs> I have just one last question for you um, that I like to ask kind of everybody that comes on the podcast. Um, is there a stigma or a misconception surrounding mental health that bothers you the most, or that you hear most often but isn't true? Um, yeah, off the top of my head, one of the main ones is that eating disorders are a result of girls just wanting to look good, like look a certain way. That is so not the case. I mean, yes, there are pressures to fit a certain mold, but it's beyond a vanity thing. Mm -hmm. It is about control. And by casting it as like an appearance based uh, mental health issue is really trivializing and uh, kind of patronizing of women. And, um, or I guess like men obviously experience eating disorders as well, but often women are sort of um, umbrella as having an eating disorder because they want to look skinny. Mm-hmm. And uh, like I said, it can contribute, but even, even if it is, even if you talk to someone who has a, a girl or a woman who has an eating disorder and it's because they're like, wanting to look thin, that in itself is connected to power because living in a patriarchal society, women have internalized being conventionally attractive as being affiliated with power. Mm -hmm. So it's about power and control. It's not about, you know, being eye candy. Wow. I like that one. Yeah. A big one. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. That's one that like I've had a lot of issues with, especially with what I was going through. 
I, I actually am glad you asked me that because I wanted to do some writing about that myself. I might actually do that this week. I've been kind of debating. I've never in my life done any kind of like comparison pictures. Like this was me oh, during yeah. my eating disorder. I've never done that because I was too scared of it being activating. But I've been thinking about that lately. So thank you for that prompt. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, well, um, that is kind of all the questions that I had for you. Was there anything else that you wanted to bring up that we didn't touch on? Um, I think we covered a lot, and I just am so grateful. I think that you're amazing for this podcast. It felt so comfortable the whole time, and I, I really love that in um, you know in Calgary and in our our circle that. Um, we've stayed connected in some kind of way all these years and that you're, you're doing this. I think it's really important. And um, I just want to express my gratitude. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that so much. And I want to thank you for sharing all of this with me. I, I wish that I had known what you were going through when we were in school and I really, really hope that I never contributed to any of your pain and your suffering. Um, oh. but thank you so much for coming on here and being so raw and honest and vulnerable and um, sharing everything with me. I, I'm i so happy that I got to experience this. Okay, if people that are listening want to reach out to you or have more questions or anything like that, can they do that? Are you yeah. open to that? Yeah. Um, what is the best way for them to contact you? Um, they can find me on Instagram. Uh, mm -hmm. My Instagram handle is at Christy Melhorn. So okay. um, obviously the at symbol and then C-H-R-I-S-T-I-E-M-E-L-H-O-R-N. Um, exactly like it sounds. Christy like the cookies. Melhorn like the German instrument. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I'll, I'll put that in the description as well so people can see that. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Feel free to reach out at any time. You can contact me on Instagram and Facebook at Stomp the Stigma YYC, and you can email me at Stomp the Stigma YYC at gmail.com. If you like the podcast, please like and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts. And if you or someone you know would like to come on, I would love to have you share your story, speak your truth, and together we can stomp the stigma.